So uh, as as I mentioned, um, our first time sharing, and uh, you know we are excited to share uh, from the depths of our experience as a married couple. Um, you know we've we've got a, we've, we've learned a lot, and uh, are excited to, to bless you guys with that. Um, but we wanted to talk today about the topic of fear, um, and the way that we've been learning to confront and to face some of the fears that we have in our own life. Uh, Aristotle said, and I found this quote earlier this afternoon, I like it, um, fair, fear is the pain arising from the anticipation of evil. Fear is uh, pain arising from the anticipation of evil. And um, it's been interesting for us as we've learned to notice how fear motivates sometimes our communication with each other, the ways in which we interact with others. And, uh, and uh, as we've uh, throughout our dating process and engagement and into marriage, uh, entered more deeply into this process of relating with each other, um, it's been interesting to know just how much of the time fear shapes uh, how we move towards each other, even though neither of us would have considered ourselves, I don't think, as terribly fearful people. Um, and, uh, and one thing that we've been learning that we'd like to talk today about is, is how we've been uh, learning how to move rather from fear, but um, into connection instead, um, uh, to move not into conflict, but from a place of vulnerability. Yes, we will bring all of the two months of our experience to bear today. Um, but really, we, we're excited to share, and we speak from learning. We are learning a lot right now. Um, so, earlier this week, uh, we were walking to the tea in the morning, and uh, we were having a conversation, and I shared with Josh that I was so excited because our paperwork for our marriage certificate arrived, so I could officially change my name. And uh, in Josh's love of semantics and need to clarify and, and be right, he said, well, technically your name's already changed because it's on our marriage certificate. You just have to notify people now. And I was like, okay. And he kind of continued to say like, so it doesn't really matter how you, you know, you can do it here or there, it doesn't really matter. And I got so mad. I mean, I just like, it really set me off. I got really defensive and to the point where he almost just was like, I'm just gonna turn around and go home. <laughs> this, is, this is not fun. I'm just gonna go back home. You can like walk to the team and go to work. Uh, so I got to the train station, and we don't do this very often where we like don't resolve something before we walk away from each other, but we just were like, okay, bye, like, I'll see you later, I don't even know what to say. And I got on the train and I was angry, but I was really confused because I was trying to figure out like, what the heck just happened? I went from, in like five minutes, I went from being excited about changing my name to Wilson to like not wanting to be a Wilson and just, you know, being so mad and, um, Maybe this has happened to you before. I think that for some reason, the closer our relationships are, the quicker and the more deeply they can trigger us, right? And um, so maybe this has happened to you before, either with your spouse or a boyfriend or girlfriend or like a family member, a parent, a sibling, even a roommate or a friend. Um, yeah, I think this happens to us a lot. So, um one of the things that, as we've processed this, one of the things that we've noticed is, uh, as I kind of was alluding to earlier, that when we get behind these strategies, these ways of interacting and engaging each other that cause problems in a relationship, so often at the root of these strategies, at the root of these uh, conflicts, is fear that's driving it. Um, and um, instead of um, moving from that fear uh, what we've been working to do, learning to do together, is uh, to notice, um, to notice uh, how, that, hey, I'm acting in a weird way. Like, why am I all heated all of a sudden? Like, why is this a big deal to me? Um, taking a step back and, and noticing, and then attempting to name, like, what's, what's going on here? Like, why is this an issue for me? Um, and then from that place, reach out to one another in vulnerability instead of uh, from that place of, of fear. Um, so a story in the scripture that I think is really interesting and discusses, uh, or in which we see this dynamic, is uh, in the book of 2 Samuel. 
you got your Bible with you, flip over there real quick. Uh, 2 Samuel, we're going to be in chapter 6 today. And uh, just to give you a little bit of background on uh, the story that we're reading, this is, this is a, a marital dispute, a marital dispute between King David and one of his wives, uh, Michal. And uh, the, the background of what's going on in this story in, in chapter 6 of 2 Samuel uh, is that David was bringing the Ark of the Covenant to the capital city, to Jerusalem. And David was stoked about this. This was a big deal. For a long time, the presence of God had been on the outskirts. It had been in this small village. And uh, finally, after a long time, the ark was going to rest. The presence of God was going to rest back in the capital, close to home, at the center of things, where it ought to be. So it was, it was an appropriate time for celebration, and David was psyched. Uh, as we read from uh, the Psalms and and from uh, the historical books in the Old Testament, we know that David was an emotional guy. He was a passionate guy. And we see that here uh, as he leads the parade into Jerusalem. Read with me. I'm going to read from the Message Translation. And we're in 2 Samuel chapter 6, picking up in verse 14. It says, David, ceremonially dressed in priest's linen, danced with great abandon before God. The whole country was with him as he accompanied the chest of God with shouts and trumpet blasts. But as the chest of God came into the city of David, Michal, Saul's daughter, happened to be looking out a window. When she saw King David leaping and dancing before God, her heart filled with scorn. They brought the chest of God and set it in the middle of the tent pavilion that David had pitched for it. Then and there David worshipped, offering burnt offerings and peace offerings. When he had completed the sacrifices of burnt and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of of the God of the angel armies, and handed out to each person in the crowd, men and women alike, a loaf of bread, a date cake, a date cake, and a raisin cake. Then everyone went home. Look what it says in verse 20. David returned home to bless his family, riding high on the emotion, no doubt. Michal, Saul's daughter, came out to greet him. How wonderfully the king has distinguished himself today exposing himself to the eyes of the servants made like some burlesque street dancer. So, uh, I actually was not familiar with this story when we were talking about where we could see an example in scripture of what we've experienced in our relationship, and I was genuinely surprised at how perfectly I think this reflects what we often experience. Um, so, David is just being himself, I think. Um, and Mikhail, who is Saul's daughter and one of David's wives, gets angry because he's dancing so freely and so openly in front of so many people. Um, different translations say that her heart was filled with scorn, like it says in the message, uh, disdain. One translation says that she despised him in her heart. Um, these are pretty, I would say these are like pretty intense words to describe how she reacted to this. Um, and it, I think it, it kind of makes me pause to wonder, okay, what's going on here for her <laughs> that she saw this and had such a strong reaction to it? And um, I think that we can infer by her reaction and then the thing that she says to David at the end that it seems like she is afraid or uh, for either their image or at least her image to be kind of tarnished in the in the eyes of their community, right? Like it seems like she is really nervous about how this looks to people, and um, maybe she's even afraid. You know, she mentions dancing in front of the other women and the women servants, and maybe she's even afraid of how the women in the town and the community are going to see David. Um, maybe even if he's like doing this on purpose, and. Uh, it's possible that she's even a little bit jealous of his freedom, right? And so uh, what do we see her do in response to her fear? Uh, I think there's a few things that I'm going to put words to that um, I think that she does in this story and that I think I at least have seen myself do. So uh, the first thing, I would say she judges him. So she so quickly jumps to disdain, to scorn. I think she makes a, a lot of judgment about what he's doing. Um, she's sarcastic with him. She, she says, it says in verse 20, how wonderfully the king has distinguished himself today. You know, she kind of is mocking him. Um, 
and and she criticizes him. She, in one translation, calls it vulgar. In this translation, like a burlesque street dancer. Um, so she's she's really critical. I think in that way she even shames him. Like she uses, I think she kind of makes herself like she's the righteous one and he's the bad one. And she uses this language to kind of just insinuate that he's he's really done something wrong here. Um, and yeah, positions herself as righteous. So, um, the reason that this story is so interesting, I think, for us is that it reveals um, what happens so often for us when fear is operating in the background. Um, so often, we don't actually notice the fear, or at least I don't notice the fear. Well, what does come into display pretty, pretty clearly is the responses, the strategies that are used in order to defend oneself. So, so what do I mean by strategy? So a strategy um, it is a plan of action design, designed to achieve an aim, right? It, it's, a, it's a plan, and, and in a relational context like this, it's just a way that we've trained ourselves to respond. We have habits and patterns of how we react in order to defend ourselves, in order to protect ourselves from the things we fear. So whenever we have fear going on in the background, if we're not intentional about it, if we're not processing it, we, and it, we enact certain strategies which help to protect us, to keep us from experiencing those things that we fear. And naming our strategies, learning how to identify them, as I mentioned earlier, has been a really important thing in Ali and my relationship. Um, because after we've named things, it's, it's enabled us to, to recognize what's going on and to attempt a, a different approach. Um, I think Ali's going to share first, and we'll both share a couple of strategies that have uh, characterized our relationship at times. Yes, so here comes the confession, yeah. confession part. Uh, we, so my, one of my most common strategies is actually kind of close to what we see Mikhail do in this story, unfortunately. So I have a tendency to make judgments and then to criticize, and actually Josh uses the word to berate Josh. Just kind of harsh um, to try and control him, and mostly I do this because, like the, the circumstances when we've seen this come out most common, is um, that Josh is uh, a little bit more distracted than I am. He doesn't always pay attention to our space the way that I do. He's not necessarily as kind of like tidy as I am, um, and he moves through life a lot faster than I do. He's just he's more busy. He's got a lot more people that he wants to see and hang out with, and there's not as much margin in his life. And so um, this really triggers for me a fear of like chaos and messiness in life. And it's taken me a while. I mean, we've been dating, engaged, and married for about a year and a half now. Um, and it's taken me a while to be able to accept that like, it's not just that I'm right and things should be, slower and more paced and more clean and tidy. It's that like, I have some need for this. And, and really the fear that's underneath this for me is I'm afraid of losing kind of my sense of stability in life. Um, I'm afraid of forgetting things, letting people down, embarrassing myself in front of people because I didn't have enough time to like prepare something or make my house clean um, or even just have enough time to like feel connected to myself so that when I'm with people, I can really be present. It's really important to me. Um, and really, there's a lot that drives this for me. So uh, this has been over a process of a few years of reflection and realizing these things about myself, but I grew up in a really type A family, and I'm not really type A. And I uh, was always kind of like flighty, and my mom always called me free-spirited as a kid. Um, and so... <laughs> Uh, I think she meant it as a compliment, but I think she it couldn't really overpower the like amount of type A-ness in my family. So there was this uh, kind of underlying feeling for me of like, I just can't get, like, I just can't get ahead of things. Like, I just can't really get a handle on things well enough. Somehow there's like a little bit of defective something in me that I just can't do this the way everyone else can. And uh, so I, I remember a lot as a kid, people telling me I was forgetful. And that was like a really bad thing. So I created all of these mechanisms in my life to not be forgetful. So I have like all of these little things that I do 
that I think now most people would say I appear very responsible, even though in my family I think I'm still the youngest, like irresponsible kid. Um, but I created all of these things and I didn't really realize until I got into a close relationship with Josh uh, that I had created all of these things that was really the thing that was kind of keeping my sense of order and stability and even my sense of value, right? Like, I'm afraid of how this is going to look to people if I don't do all of these things. And really, the underlying fear of that is that people aren't going to like me, that they're going to like get to know something that's messy, and then they're going to walk away. So there's there's like a deep sense of value and identity for me that's tied up in this. So you can imagine that like in the morning, if Josh is like do it, do the dishes, how like that little thing can kind of erupt for me into like. My whole day is ruined, you know? Um, and really what it creates when I do this, when I kind of become this critical person, uh, it just creates more distance and hurt for us, right? And actually, um, it creates a greater sense of being out of control because I even feel more disconnected from him. And uh, usually it doesn't really work. Like, it'll work at first to, like, pick, to, like, do something that I want, but ultimately he just feels kind of beat up, you know? And it doesn't really get us anywhere. Uh, unlike Ali, I have no strategies. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, so, um, strategies are endless. We express um, our fears and we respond to our fears. We cope with them in different ways. Um, one of the strategies that I'm very, very not proud of, um, that, uh, but I've, I've learned to detect, I've learned to realize, is that at times I will assert my views with undue levels of force and those of you who know me have experienced this. Um, and uh, really what's going on is I am, my identity is super tied up to achievement. Um, for those of you who have done some work in the Enneagram, it's been a really resourceful tool for us. And um, for me, uh, achieving, moving the ball forward is very important. Um, it feels like my worth is often attached to what I do and what I'm able to do. And so when I'm in a situation where I'm trying to see something happen, I'm trying to make something go in a certain way, and I'm confronted with a challenge uh, from somebody else who is trying to input in a way that I don't think is helpful. I've learned that I have a, a big personality. I'm a charismatic guy. And sometimes uh, the easiest way to move past the challenge and into what I think is the right course of action is just to state something so strongly that nobody dares challenge me. It works. A lot of times it works. Um, and in the process, I've heard a lot of people, uh, particularly as I was more immature, but still do it sometimes. Um, so in my desire to, to see things happen and in my fear for, well, what happens if, if we don't move forward with the best strategy, if we don't move forward with the best idea? In my fear to avoid that and to, to see something accomplished that I care about, Often what happens is a byproduct is I end up shutting the people down. Even though I may attest to desiring collaborative leadership and empowering people and getting everybody involved, uh, there are times when uh, my actions actually do the precise opposite of that because I'm too afraid of what will happen if we get sidetracked and we go down a, a poor, in my view, route uh, to allow the conversation to really play out. And so I just run over somebody and we do the thing that I think is best um, on the force of my personality. Uh, and that's been an area where uh, I have, at times, defended myself against perceived fear, fear of failure at the expense of, of other people in the relationships that I have to. Uh, so I'm gonna give another example of one of my strategies that I think is pretty different from the first, it's actually kind of opposite. Uh, so another strategy that I often use, uh, and I'm, I've, grown a bit in this, but um, I find myself doing it quite a bit, is I tend to, I just kind of withdraw, and then I kind of start to feel sorry for myself, like it's my fault, I did something wrong, um, really it's like a woe is me, uh, and then, and then the really tricky thing that I do that it's taken me a long time to notice is actually a strategy, uh, is that I then try to like invoke compassion. So this happens a lot with Josh, where I just like, I get really emotional, and then it's like, well now he can't like, you know, argue with me or something, because I'm just so upset. Um, 
And this is a tricky one because sometimes I am legitimately upset. Uh, but I'm, I've started to notice the times when I'm like, I think I can actually handle this conversation, but I'm just afraid of like, what if I can't explain myself well enough or what if I end up being wrong, right? Um, it gives me this kind of like really manipulative sense of control, right? And especially based on what he just described, he can come off really strong and clear headed and he's committed and so it feels like my only way, like getting out of this conversation is just like, I just, you know, break down. Um, and I've started to notice like in these moments, I'm really, af I'm really actually afraid of being wrong. Like I think maybe I might be wrong and that means I have to change a whole bunch of things, right? Like I have to, so, so if it's true that my name is actually already changed and I can do this in any order I want, then like, all right, well then I guess I don't have to do A, B, C, you know, whatever, keep the order that I wanted. Um, but there's this fear of being wrong. And then that means I have to change things. And I think tied to that, there's a fear that, that like he'll judge me for being wrong, that somehow that makes me less smart than him, not as valuable as him. Um, even though we have a lot of trust, we're married, I know he loves me, it's still kind of like hard-coded that if I'm wrong, that makes me somehow less valuable if I got something wrong, you know? Uh, and so my when I feel like I might be wrong, I just kind of pull away and then just kind of break down. I can't handle it. Um, and and really, that means I just don't, I don't have to be wrong anymore because I've created this diversion. The conversation's not happening. And uh, what this does is actually just makes me feel worse about myself. And it doesn't let us actually hear each other. So last one for me, um, to throw another one out there. Um, probably one of my deepest rooted fears shows up um, in the difficulty I have with uh, allowing for space in conflict. So um, it will come as no surprise to you guys that I'm an extrovert um, and I process verbally and I want to work through things and get things resolved. Um, but sometimes when I'm in a conflict, particularly in a conflict with somebody who's very close to me, um, somebody that I care deeply about, um, Allie in particular is more introverted, and sometimes when we're going back on and forth on something, and we disagree, or even more she's hurt and upset with me about something, she'll need some time to withdraw and to process that. And that has been so hard for me, just brutally hard for me. Um, and sometimes I, I respond to that by pressing, like, we need to have this conversation right now. Like, you're going to go in the other room, I'm going to follow you into the other room. We're just going to keep talking about it. I'll change tone, I'll change tactics, but, but I'll press. Um, and, and really what's going on there for me in my uh, inability or unwillingness to create space is a fear of abandonment, a fear of losing control. Um, Many of you know my story and know um, that several years ago, uh, before I met Allie by a couple of years, um, I went through a really painful divorce. Um, and that, that part of my journey really just blew up everything in my life at the time. Um, I, I thought I knew who I was, I thought I knew who she was, I thought I knew what we were doing. And then uh, one day, out of nowhere, my, my wife at the time, Tiffany, came in and said, uh, I want you to leave. And, and in the months that followed, I began to realize that so much of what I believed about, about myself, so much of what I believed about her, and so much uh, about, uh, that I believed just about the world was just totally wrong. I was just totally oblivious and had missed so many things. And uh, one of the most painful realizations uh, for me in that space was the fact that uh, as we navigated that process, the thing that I so desperately wanted, which was reconciliation, um, despite my many attempts and my eloquent speech and persuasive, charismatic personality, that I was powerless to affect any change with her. And, and uh, she, she wouldn't listen, she wouldn't move. And, and that has, that, that resulting abandonment that I experienced and, and hurt that I experienced in that, that situation, while I feel like I've healed from that in most ways, um, ends up getting triggered sometimes when we're in a conversation, when we're in a space, and, and Allie is upset and won't let me deal with it. Like, we can't resolve it right now. She just needs to be alone. And in that space where I don't have input, I, don't, I, 
I can't speak into it. I can't influence in any way. She's on her own process, and I don't know what's going to come out on the other end of that. Some of those fears and some of those hurts will start to resurface for me in really deep ways. And I'll start to wonder, uh, even subconsciously, you know, where is this going? Am I okay? Am I secure? And that anxiety will drive me sometimes to push. Um, and that's occurred in the relationship with Allie. It's, it's occurred in other relationships as well. And, um, oftentimes, at the moments where that's been the most unchecked, what has really resulted is the opposite of what I've intended to. Instead of reconciliation happening, because I don't know when to back off, because I'm pressing so hard, I actually break things. I break things in the relationship. Maybe because somebody who wasn't ready for something is being forced into a conversation that they don't want to have. Um, so confronting my fear of abandonment and my lack of control uh, has been a key uh, as we've worked through this. So we're gonna turn back to the story of Mikkel and David and look at kind of what happened, what were the consequences of the way that she handled this. And then we're gonna talk about what could the alternative be and what has an alternative path looked like for us. So um, if we go back to 2 Samuel 6, and I'm gonna start and just read verses 21 to 23, pick up where we left off. Uh, David replied to Mikkel, in God's presence I'll dance all I want. He chose me over your father and the rest of our family and made me prince over God's people over Israel. Oh yes, I'll dance to God's glory more recklessly even than this. And as far as I'm concerned, I'll gladly look like a fool. But among these maids you're so worried about, I'll be honored to no end. The cow, Saul's daughter, was barren the rest of her life. So, uh, I would say that the one good thing here is David seems pretty clear on his identity and what he's about, and he's not really persuaded by her at all. But I would also say that he comes back pretty angry and combative and like dismisses her, doesn't really see her at all, um, ultimately kind of punishes her. Um, it just, it creates a lot of conflict and I think kind of really like disrupts their relationship, right? And then even to the point where it says she was barren the rest of her life, like there's, I mean, this is extreme. Um, but there's clearly a consequence, right? Like what we described in all of these scenarios for us, there's this consequence that happens when we come to each other with our fears unchecked and we're just kind of like reacting. Um, so what could another option have looked like? What does an alternative mean? How do we do this differently? And uh, so a potential alternate, alternate path for Mikhail, I would, I would uh, suggest, um, started before David even came back from the celebration. It started the moment that she saw him and that she let herself feel disdain for him. The moment that she let herself just unchecked, become judgmental, make something up in her mind about him, and then that translated right into her reacting the way that she did. When he came home so I think that uh, if she had you know alternatively if she'd been able to acknowledge like you know oh this is weird I'm having a really strong reaction right now and maybe I maybe this scares me like what he's doing makes me nervous about something and if she could actually recognize that and recognize like that maybe this fear isn't really valid or I don't really need to worry about this or it's not that big of a deal um, if she could have even brought that fear to God Right, and surrendered that to God, uh, then maybe she could have reacted to David differently. She could have still said something to him, but maybe she wouldn't have brought something with sarcasm and scorn and disdain and judgment. Maybe she would have come to him and just shared, like, I don't know. Uh, it may, I don't like when you do that. It makes me uncomfortable. You know, something that's more constructive. Um, and so we... As, as we've been preparing to share with you guys today, it's been really helpful for us actually to think through, like, what do we do? What have we learned to do together? And kind of put words to that. So, um, yeah, we'll kind of walk through what we're learning about how to do this better together. So uh, one key piece of this, or the shift that uh, we've been trying to make, learning to make, and would invite you to make, is from a place of defensiveness, from a place of fear, to a place of vulnerability. And, and that starts with understanding what your strategy is by taking time to notice. Uh, we call it a strategy, uh, sometimes we call it a racket. It's good to know what your rackets are, what your games are, what your strategies are. 
Because in order to move um, from a place of vulnerability, first we're going to have to, to recognize what we're afraid of. And, and that's tough because uh, being, uh, noticing is hard, being vulnerable is hard. Uh, there's, a re there's a reason we operate in these ways, right? Uh, it's, it's easier to move from a place of defensiveness. But when we, when we choose to instead shift into a place of vulnerability, it, it opens up a space for intimacy. Um, one of our friends says, uh, intimacy is into me see. It's a place to be known. It's a place for connection. And only when we shift into that place of intimacy, of, of speaking from, this is what I'm afraid of. Like, do we have an opportunity for the other person to respond, to extend compassion, to hear us, to hear our heart, to get what's going on, and for that to, to become not a, a disjointing or a or uh, uh, an experience that pushes the other away, but uh, an experience that pulls the other in instead. So the, the shift is, is from fear uh, to vulnerability. But before we can do this, we have to, to learn what's going on, uh, to notice our fears, and, and to name them. And I've found that this, is, uh, this can be difficult for a lot of reasons. Uh, I think for, uh, for me as a dude, uh, there's an inherent fear connected in this with uh, even admitting that I have fear, right? Because I'm, I'm a dude. I'm awesome and tough and, and fearless and courageous, right? So, so admitting that, like, I'm actually afraid of something is, is really, it feels unmasculine. It feels inappropriate. It feels like I've been culturally trained not to do this. And so, so for me... Admitting that, that I have something that I'm afraid of, moving in vulnerability instead, um, is a hard choice. It's a choice that uh, forces me to admit something about myself that I don't like. And I would say as a woman, I have come to notice that, uh, that for me, acknowledging that I have a fear is not, it's not so much about like, the image of that, right? But it's actually that I have come to believe that if I acknowledge my fear, it makes me more fragile. Like if I say I have a fear, then it, it's somehow more powerful and it affects me and I'm fragile. Um, when what my experience has been as I've, as I've tried doing this is that when I acknowledge my fear, it actually makes me stronger. Um, but, the, but the belief, the lie that I tend to live in is like, this will make me more fragile if I say this out loud. So we, we have different gendered ways of shielding ourselves from actually uh, addressing our fears and, and, and actually recognizing and naming them. But they're, they're there uh, for all of us. And Brene Brown says the level to which we protect ourselves from being vulnerable is a measure of our fear and disconnection. And I think she's right. Um, it starts with naming the fears. But to do that, we're going to have to notice first. We've got to recognize what's going on. And this is admittedly a process. Uh, because, especially for me, I move so fast, sometimes I'm just oblivious to what's going on. I don't actually know what's happening in my heart very well. Um, Allie is better at this than I am. But one thing that I've been learning is that um, really my emotions are the indicator lights of my soul. Emotions are the indicator lights of the soul, I started saying. And what I mean by this is, as I have uh, begun to recognize and name the strategies, the rackets that we've just described, when I see that I'm entering into that, when I see that I'm acting out in an emotional way, and I'm like, wow, my, my voice is raised all of a sudden here. My temperature is up. Like, I'm feeling really, you know, there's a lot of energy around this for me. Uh, I've begun to say, like, what is going on here? Like, why, why is my chest tightening up? Like, what is, what is going on here for me? Um, and oftentimes, as I've moved back from my racket, back from my strategy, back from my emotion, to reflection, what I've uncovered is the fear that is driving us. So kind of similar to the first story that I shared where I got on the train and was confused. I think even that step for me has been a, a growth, a growing area for me to realize like, this is, this is bizarre. There's something weird going on. And uh, before I can come back to Josh and apologize, I can still come back to him and apologize, but it helps me to know and to come back to him when I apologize and be able to say, like, hey, this is what was going on. This is what I was afraid of. Um, so we've got six steps, if you want to write them down. Um, 
after you after you've kind of taken that moment to notice like there's something weird happening here I'm having kind of an outsized reaction or I'm just becoming a person that I don't want to be right in this moment um, I would say yeah pause to become aware and ask yourself if there's some outcome or some experience that you are anticipating that scares you like what are you, what have you already made up in your mind where this conversation is going to go and what it's going to mean and a lot of times we do this, we tell ourselves stories and we don't even know we're doing it, right? So just pausing and notice, like, what have I already decided? And uh, if, is there something about that that scares me? Like, what is that gonna mean for me? And then after you've done that, I would say acknowledge that there's a fear. <laughs> just acknowledge, like, I'm, a, I'm afraid of something. Um, and if you can name what the fear is, I think that's really powerful, being able to put words to it. If you can't name it, I think it's just as powerful to say, like, hey, there's something going on for me. I can't really put my finger on it, but I recognize that there's more going on right now than just the conversation we're having. Like, I'm afraid of something. Something's going on for me. And even try to process it with that person. Um, the third thing I would say is turn to God. So kind of, like, confess your fear to God and remind yourself of who you are to God and of who God is to you. There's lots of scripture that we uh, didn't compile for today, but there's lots of scripture that just talks about who God is and how he relates to us and what he does in the sight of fear. Um, and so I think like turning to scripture and turning to God is a really important step. And surrendering the fear, that's the fourth step. So confess it. And I think part of the confession is confessing uh, our pride and thinking that we have some control over how our relationships are going to go, right? Because it's always us and another person. And we don't really have control over that other person. So I think just confessing that. Um, and the sixth, uh, sorry, the fifth thing is to have a greater vision. And I think this is essential. Um, that fear is always gonna be more important than anything else unless we decide that we have a vision that's more important than our fear. Unless we decide like, no, I wanna be connected to you. Or I want our marriage to look like this. Or I want our friendship to look like this. Or hey, with my roommate, you know, I, I wanna be able to be honest with you. Or I wanna feel like we know each other. Whatever the vision is that you want for your relationships, just be clear about that and let that be more compelling, right? Um, and then turn towards the person. This is a, um, I forget who, who says it, but it's a kind of a known thing in marriage is that uh, what makes most marriages more successful is that more often than not people turn towards each other instead of away from each other. And I think this is true in all of our relationships. We always have this choice to turn away and kind of do it on our own or avoid them, or whatever, or to turn towards them and to bring what we have. Um, and so once we've kind of gone through this process, I think actually bringing them to the person is like, is like the most important final step. Uh, and when we do that, we get to confess that we have a fear. Um, we get to share what our vision is. So I think that often opens up a lot of space for me and Josh when I can actually say like, I actually really do care about you and I really do want to be close to you. And I know that I'm not doing that very well right now. Um, we can like become curious and ask questions and try to understand and know each other better. So uh, to go back to the first story about what happened for us earlier this week, our debate over changing my name. Um, as I continue throughout the day to figure out what the heck happened this morning, um, I admitted to myself, and this is related to the fear that I described, that I was really overly committed to uh, my, like the way that I was thinking about getting my name changed and the steps that I had already researched and decided so that I didn't forget anything. Because you guys, in the process of getting engaged and planning a wedding and moving and being married, there's like so many little things. And, and so I was starting, I, it was like, this is like the last thing I feel like, one of the last things that I have to get done. And uh, so I already had a plan. Like I had a, a checklist. Like I'm gonna go to social security office, I'm gonna go to my DMV, I'm gonna change all my credit cards. 
And so for it felt like in that moment, he was like threatening. He was just like, well, you don't have to do it in that order. And, it doesn't, and that's not even what you're doing. And I just was like, I, you know, I got really scared, I think, because I really wanted to control it. And, uh, and it felt like he was threatening that. So that night I came back to Josh and, and I apologized for being so defensive. Um, and I confessed that I had this fear. And I think because we've been working on this together, he actually was able to come to me and say, thanks for saying that. And I realized that I was being probably overly aggressive and needing to be right and needing to tell you what was quote unquote right, even though it wasn't really that helpful. And clearly you didn't need to hear it. And, uh, and so we were able to hear each other and then agree like, so I'm gonna do this the way that works for me and uh, we can yeah, move forward from there, <laughs> kind of compromise. Um, but I think for us, we were able to go to sleep that night feeling like we were okay. The, uh, this, this has been something that we've been learning and coming back to over and over again. And I think going into marriage, we knew this, um, but we've experienced it even more profoundly than we anticipated. And that's that um, marriage uh, is refining, that it's an image of the gospel, uh, it's a tool which brings us into increasing Christ likeness. Uh, Tim Keller, who many of you know, says uh, the reason that marriage is painful and wonderful is because it's a reflection of the gospel, which is painful and wonderful at once. The gospel is this we're more sinful and flawed in, our ser in ourselves than we ever dared believe. At the same time, we're more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. This is the only kind of relationship that will really transform us. I think we've been discovering uh, some of this in this, which we're trying to bring out to you today, and that's, that's fundamentally that it, when we allow our fear to hold on, when we don't deal with it, when we don't recognize it, it drives a wedge in our relationship, it drives a wedge between us. But when we move in confession and vulnerability, and in recognizing what's going on for us being willing to pay attention to that and then share that with others who love us, whether it's a spouse or a friend or a roommate or someone else, that that opens up a space for connection. It opens up a space for intimacy and even for compassion. Uh, when that happens, we're able to be forgiven. Proverbs 28 says uh, in verse 13, people who conceal their sins won't prosper, but if they confess and turn from them, they'll receive mercy. So that's what we're talking about. We're really talking about the gospel in our relationships. How can we learn to move from fear to the practice of vulnerability and confession that instead of causing separation in our relationship, brings intimacy instead? So uh, we wanted to close with a little exercise. And um, as we've been talking, I've even been noticing this theme connected to a lot of our fears, which is control. We just really want to control as much as possible. And the fear really comes in when we feel like we're losing control. And um, so I, I've done this once before, and I'm going to lead us in what's called an imaginative reading of scripture. And I've chosen a gospel story that I think kind of speaks to fear. And um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read it three times. So I'm going to ask you guys to close your eyes and kind of get comfortable in your seat. And then each time that I read it, I'll give you a prompt before I read it, uh, so you have something in your mind to be thinking about. Yeah, so go ahead and close your eyes. And take a deep breath in. And let it out. So I'm going to read from Mark chapter 4. And when I read it the first time, keep your eyes closed. And as I read it, just try to imagine the scene. What does it look like? What does it sound like? Are there smells? Who's there? What do they look like? What does it feel like? Is it hot or cold? So on that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him, Jesus, with them in the boat. And other boats were with them. And a great windstorm arose. And the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. 
but he was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And they woke Jesus and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? As I read it a second time, just notice where you are in the scene. Who are you? What are you doing? What does it feel like to be you in the scene? And where are you in relationship to Jesus? On that day, when the evening had come, Jesus said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose. And the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? listen a third time, just consider what Jesus has for you in this story, or what God might be wanting to tell you. And I'll leave some time for silence after I read it for reflection. On that day, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Jesus, you are with us in our darkest moments, in the fears that we have that come from the deepest places of our soul. You already see them. You already know them. And you love us anyway. I pray, Lord, that as a community, as a family, as friends, as spouses, as brothers and sisters, and roommates, and co-workers, and fellow travelers along the way, that we would learn to slow down, to recognize our fears, to come face to face with them and, and have the courage to name them, to give them to you, 
to move out of vulnerability to a place of connection with others. Father, I pray that our fears would not be those things which fuel conflict in our lives and drive a wedge between us and others. But Jesus, would you teach us to be still in your presence, to surrender them to you and to use our fears, those places in our life that, that we're most in dread of, that these places would be the sources of connection sources of intimacy, sources of compassion, and depth of relationship with other places, with other people. Might we bring them to the light and experience your healing touch. It's in Jesus' name that we ask it.